Thanks for coming. My name's Ken Coles. Those of you that don't know me, I'm manager of uh, Farming Smarter. This is a co-hosted event uh, between Alberta Agriculture and uh, Dune Polly is uh, going to be leading the Alberta Agriculture side of things in just a moment. What we're going to do, I think, is we're, we're going to start off with uh, Dune. He's, he's done the, uh, the traditional check of the weather, that, uh, the types of things that we've seen this year as far as the growing season is concerned. Um, I did go for a walk this morning and I dug up a bunch of samples that, uh, uh, of some of the issues and some things that are interesting as far as our research projects are concerned. So we'll go through with that and then Brian uh, is going to talk about some of the results from the massive winter wheat project. We're not going to be focusing on it on the field school. It just so happens this is a nice stage to actually look at it. We just rated our downy brome and Japanese brome trials that uh, show some very interesting results and such. And then if we can convince Brian, those three of you that want to go for a walk, we can uh, take them out there and, and look at some of the plots. So, if we can convince Brian. Okay, so uh, please feel free to grab a coffee, sit down if you like, or huddle up in the corner over there. That's fine too. Just a couple of comments. Um, I'm new to the South, but apparently um, Ken said that Ross McKenzie always used to do a little bit of a brief discussion about um, various weather aspects. So yesterday I ran um, some of the data from uh, the, the demo farm, one from Barnwell, another one from Bow Island. And generally, um, from those three locations, for the past month we probably um, were ahead of the game as far as growing degree day heat accumulation. And up to yesterday, we were probably somewhere in that 20 to 30 millimeters of, of precipitation below normal. Um, so it's nice to see that the weather forecasters actually got it right today and that and with this rain I suspect we would probably be back about normal accumulation for the for the month of May. So it's so it's um, it's been a little bit of a different growing season. We've been definitely a little bit later on the start, but it's overall, you know, the um, overall, I guess it, I'd say it's just not too bad. It's not exceptionally abnormal, and um, a little bit extra heat, that's, that's just fine. So today we'll, um, Ken will be taking a lead role since most of the stuff is from, from their site. In the subsequent weeks, we'll be seeing a couple of different things, and um, the, the crop walks, again, are, are fairly informal. One that isn't on the schedule that um, you may be interested in. Sometime in July, we'll also be doing a one that's kind of dedicated towards hemp. And so, if, if you're curious about hemp, um, industrial hemp, um, <laughs> that one might come up in July as well. So we'll we'll just see how that turns out. That, that's what I'll have, Ken. No, oh, great. <laughs> So I guess we did manage, uh, we phoned the CCA folks, so if anybody that wants to sign up we, for CCA credits, we can apply for them after the fact. I know a bunch of you guys like to have CCA credits, so they'll be right here beside the, the microphone. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to also recognize is that we did get a lot of sponsorship for these crop walks. It sort of uh, helps us ensure that we have the time to do it and, and get you guys out. So I want to thank UFA, and most of the grower groups, ACPC, the Canola Guys, the, the New Alberta Wheat Commission, the Alberta Pulse Commission. Um, did I miss anybody? Yeah. And UFA are the main uh, sponsors, but we also have a number, n number of other sponsors that uh, will have a banner up. You can phone them up and say thanks for us. So, You know, this is going to be best if we keep this, uh, like Dune said, as informal as possible. I think that... Uh, you know, if we can have a good conversation, this is a good opportunity for us to, to hear what's going on in the field, what kind of issues you guys have, any types of questions. Uh, I know that you didn't come here to just listen to us talk. I think that I uh, want to encourage that everybody participates. So, so how many people uh, are pretty excited about this year? Yeah. Not a bad year. I, and I think that we have a pretty big advantage compared to the rest of the um, country it seems like we were the ones that uh, got our crops in earlier there's still a lot of seeding going on in Saskatchewan maybe some of you guys your retailers um, 
how much is done in Saskatchewan? Are they still have a lot to go? No Saskatchewan folks? Yeah. Moving along. How, how are the crops looking this year? Are things coming up nicely? Any issues? You got some spotty emergence? What do you think it is? Yeah. Getting pretty dry, so this rain is uh, pretty good, pretty timely. We've, we've been teased around here, and there's been thunderstorms that seem to be happening literally on Highway 3 that miss us. You know, that's like every farmer says. Rained a quarter mile down the road, but, um, but not here. I, I haven't seen pivots running so much in early spring as I have this year. Um, a few of those uh, folks down Bow Island Tabor, they, they all have their dugouts and their irrigating before the canals are even running. So that's, that's pretty interesting. Yes, Rob. Any cutworms or Does anybody have any issues? I know that there was a bunch of communications that went out regarding cutworms, and I think that they might have been a little bit overblown. I think there was a few fields. I just spoke with Hector. He does send his uh, re regrets in not being able to make it. Apparently, he's uh, got some hip issues, even though... Dune thought he saw him playing soccer the other day. <laughs> so, yeah. So that was wireworms in barley, you said? But you did have a wireworm seed treatment on it. Okay. Does anyone else have any, see any issues, cutworms? Yeah. Okay, so we did have a few fields sprayed. And some peas and winter wheat. I think that the the original scare was in some winter wheat fields that we saw. I've been watching around here, but haven't really been able to identify any. The the one thing that I did want to mention though is that uh, Jeremy Hummel and Hector will be leading a, a module focused on identifying uh, the cutworms and wireworms and damages at this year's field school at the end of the month. We've got a focus of basically everything below the ground and and that's uh, that including beneficial insects that are below the ground so that's uh, something coming on come down and they were laying their eggs in canola stubble typically so that's where they were finding it and there was a few fields sprayed. He was at one field and he said you could literally see the army cutworms like we're advancing about a foot, you know about a foot every few minutes as they were working across the field on this one. Yeah they just they just kind of like sort of like grasshopper plates they just kind of move across and the guy got out there and sprayed them and that kind of kind of cut them back. Them out, but, uh, yeah, so. What threshold are people going by? On the screen? Yeah. Like just because uh, you got one or two cutworms there doesn't mean you necessarily have a screen. Great. So, army cutworms, they defoliate. It looks like grasshopper feeding. It's very rare. that we see it. But they just, it looks like, you know, there's sort of notches under the leaves, and you're sort of thinking, what's wrong with my winter wheat? It starts to disappear. You look, look a little more close, closely. So, it's late April, typically early May. A normal year, and so you'll just see defoliation, and you sort of scratch around a little bit. And, oh, there they are! They're just they feed right during the day, late evening. No, but how many square meter? Uh, Jeremy had a number there, and it, I can't remember what it was. I am seeing one, two, but I'm not seeing twelve and thirteen square meters. So yeah, yeah, I'm sure that one square. It wouldn't, and it's just defoliation. They don't clip off the plants. They just—it's a bit like daily weevil. They just kind of defoliate it. And actually, at, at the Field Crop Development Center on the Comb, on their winter wheat uh, variety trial, they were seeing the same thing with the army cutworms that were feeding above ground, uh, doing that uh, general vegetation defoliation. And um, Jim Roach, the uh, friend of mine, entomologist that works out of there. He hadn't seen that before either, where the army cutworms feeding above ground. Like you read about it in the textbooks, but I think it's fairly unusual for Alberta. Well, they, they, they plant, 
So we didn't answer your question there. It's because we're not the experts as far as that. It means you have to come to field school, which I know you'd be there anyways. But um, I think that's the trick, though, is, is how, do, how do you get a good feel for the density uh, of the feeding? I mean, if you stop in one spot along the edge, is that good enough? Is it, uh, you know, is it further in there? So I think um, part of the reason that I wanted to have that module at the field school so I can learn, too, I, I, don't, uh, I don't have a good feeling for when it's worth the spray and I think it's important that you know if, if there is an outbreak coming that we're sort of paying attention and know know the right answers so we'll forward those questions on to to Hector and Jeremy so any other major issues you guys are seeing out there this year so far or have you even had a second to stop and look at the crops yet no nope. ouch so I'm going to pass around the, some of the peas around here. I'll just steal one. Yeah, we got some of that. Yeah, I did. So I don't know, at our location here, pea leaf weevil was very slow to come out this year because of the cold temperatures. You know, May 1st, I think we had a low of minus 10. Um, but we did have winter peas that were up and they're always the very first to be fed on so um, I was keeping a very close eye on my winter peas because that's a good indication of, of how we can send out uh, a message to everybody to stop scouting. So we've got uh, a, just a tremendous amount of feeding going on on both our winter peas now and our spring peas. So if you haven't scouted your pea fields yet, uh, it's a good time to take a look. If you had them in early, like, what's the earliest you guys got your peas in this year? April 27th. Is that, anybody else get them in that early? How many people have peas this year? I'm about there too. So beginning of May, so then your peas are probably in that four to five node stage? Yeah. So I think beyond, beyond the five node stage, we're not seeing a, uh, if you get into that six or higher, it's probably too late to spray. So you may still have a chance to get out there if you've had any issues. Um, you know, we've, we've kind of beat this one to death, but if you haven't been at, uh, at one of the crop walks or, or known that you go around and, and scout your, your clam leaf, so that's the very top leaf. In this particular instance, I've got no feeding on this leaf at all, but you'll see on the very bottom leaves, I've probably got about 30 to 40 notches out of each leaf. So in this case, if you hadn't done a, a seed treatment, it probably would have been better to spray at that two to three node stage. This one here, one, two, three, four, five, six. It's almost getting too late to spray this bad boy. Um, I'm not overly concerned about that in this situation. If you've got high, If you've got high nitrogen situations, um, which I wanted to actually ask you guys, this year I've found in all of our soil tests, we have abnormally high nitrogen. Anybody else agree with that or, or do you guys soil test at all anymore? You have to yell it out. You think it's normal? Anybody else found that or is it just me? High nitrogen situations. Sort of, yeah. You guys have probably done a ton of soil tests. Is lots of people. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's probably a good a good bet. We've had a couple of years of of quite moist uh, years. I think it's just the the soil. The the longer it is moister, the longer you know, and better chance you're going to have at mineralization. So. Around here anyways, with the higher organic matter soils and you know, lots of years of good zero tillage, lots of, lots of good stubble, we've seen that we've been probably getting a little more mineralization than we're used to. Um, 
and in some cases we've had to cut back on fertility because we just don't need it. However, I don't think a lot of guys have, uh, they like to do that. That's, that's outside of their comfort zone to cut back on fertility in those type of situations. The long and the short of it is, is I'm pretty convinced that under high fertility situations that uh, pea leaf weevil doesn't affect yield for us in any way. So in this case, we didn't spray our peas, but if you were in a low fertility zone, like you did a soil test and you're, you got 10 pounds of nitrogen, most of the yield loss is coming not from the defoliation, but from the larva feeding on the, on the nodules. So in, in the case where you don't, you know, the nodules aren't really working that hard to produce nitrogen, it seems to make sense that uh, the larva really aren't hurting all that much. So Ken, with, with the emergence of the weevil later yeah. than what we usually see, does that change the life cycle when we're going to see the weevil go down into the next stage so that is the, is the feeding period going to be compressed so that they still go down at the same time? I'm well, just wondering in their life cycle, what is it like? I don't know that their life cycle necessarily changes. It's still a general life cycle. However, they do come out based on temperature. They're there, they're just not active. So as soon as the temperature turned up, I mean, it's just the same as we just raced out there and threw the crops and, and the weevils raced out there to feed on them as soon as they appeared. So yeah, I did notice that, um, you know, in, in a more gradual increase in temperature year, you'll see a gradual increase in peel leaf weevil. This year it was, bam, they're there. And, and they're feeding like mad. So if you weren't paying attention, they could come in, do a bunch of damage. We're not 100% um, confident that spraying actually helps a lot, but uh, at the same time, it can make a, a very big difference. So I think Hector's rule of thumb is more feeling a little more comfortable about the seed treatment than the spray application, but at the same time, pea prices are really good right now. So higher, higher pea prices means economic thresholds are potentially lower. So I was, I was, I was talking about the, the feeding on the clam leaf. What that does is tells you if they're actively feeding at the time. So they'll push out a clam leaf pretty much overnight sometimes, um, within a day or two very quickly. And if you see active feeding on those, those new leaves, then you know they're there still and that they haven't been sprayed out. So in a, in a good spray job, you'll notice on the architecture of the plant, there'll be tons of feeding and if you did actually do a good job killing, your top three nodes will be clean. Uh, very little feeding on that. So anything in that two to three no um, clam leaves out of 10 plants, that's usually with the recommendation for spraying. Any questions on pea leaf weevil? Kind of old news, except that it's, you know, it, it kind of comes in cycles. It's spreading out further east, further north. Pardon me? Well, that's quite an amazing root out of a little plant, eh? I think the only reason I got that is because it's nice and wet when I dug it out this morning. But um, anyways, that other um, tray there, do you want to pass that one around? Yeah. I don't think there's actually been any work done on that. The nice thing about the weevils is that they, they don't really burrow too far down. They're just usually hiding at the soil surface. Um, if you've ever tried to find a pea leaf weevil, they're pretty tough to find. They sense vibration and they fall, they fall off the plants and they play dead and they're very well camouflaged to the soil. Um, but if you go into your field and, you know, sort of a hotter temperature time, Greg, I think is probably the chance that they're going to be out and actively feeding is a little bit better. Um, in, in the cooler temperatures, you won't find them on the plants. They're probably sitting down in the soil just waiting for it to warm up. The more the, the more the temperature they have, the more active feeding you're going to have. Um, I think that they can be killed both by contact and by feeding on the treated leaves. So probably your typical middle of the day is best. If anybody wants to see one, I've got one on the dashboard of my truck. <laughs> <laughs> can you pass me one of those plants before you pass it on? Awesome. So we've, we've talked about winter peas. Um, anybody peas look like this yet? Pretty amazing, eh? Uh, last fall, we, we pretty much reached the end of our research when it comes to the winter pulses. Uh, 
except I'm reinvigorated again this year looking at the crops. And I think the big thing that, uh, that we have to keep in mind with the winter pulses is that the winter hardiness that we have currently available just doesn't quite cut it for Western Canadian conditions for the most part. However, the Lethbridge area, while we're not as warm as Medicine Hat, we have milder winters. So I think there's a nice little radius around Lethbridge where we can almost always grow a successful crop of winter peas. And it, the, brave, the three of you, maybe, maybe it's down to two now that are going to go for a walk after because it's really, it sounds worse in here than it actually is, just so you know. But we've got a, a 10 acre piece that just looks incredible. Um, great overwintering. The big trick though that we need to have is, is good enough moisture in the fall. And last fall, we really didn't, so we cheated. And we fall irrigated and just amazing crops around here. So I do think if you're in the Lethbridge area that we might have a real shot at growing the current varieties. As you move further away from Lethbridge, further away from the mountains or closer to the mountains, I believe that the winters are just a little bit too harsh for the current varieties that we have. But keep in mind, this is how winter wheat started too, right? Is that right, Brian? Like back in the day, the winter hardiness just wasn't there for winter wheat. Oh, you have to go back to Yeah. <laughs> But I mean, it's just, you know, thinking long term, canola was a small crop once too. But uh, I, I, I still have a lot of hope that this could become a significant crop uh, to the point where I'm even thinking about growing it on my farm this fall, as long as my crop gets off soon enough. So uh, Ross McKenzie and Dunes crew, they actually gave a bunch of seed to the irrigation demo farms and they've grown out, uh, I don't know how many acres, do you know? Rob? Rob Dunn. Rob. How many acres did they plant of this over at the irrigation demo farm? So we've got 15 acres over there. We've got 10 acres here. Um, I'm expecting 80 bushels out of this. So we might even have some seed for some guys around the Lethbridge area that might want to give it a try. Uh, no guarantees though. We, we don't sign contracts. You can take a look at the weevil, uh, the, these plants when they're being passed around and, and the damage on the bottom leaves are tremendous, but uh, it's just been outgrowing the pea leaf weevil now. Uh, and in this point, I'm not really concerned about weevils affecting even the winter pea. A few years back, we did use the winter pea as a trap crop idea. Hector Carcamo has been um, playing around with this idea with cabbage seed pod weevil. So either growing a earlier season variety on the outside edges, uh, could have been a Polish variety or such. He's been finding some pretty good results on that. So the idea is, is that you, you, you attract all of your insects into that trap crop and you spray only the trap crop. So then you're not spraying the entire field, which helps um, not killing all your beneficials for one. So uh, lots of times I think in pest problems, They'll, they'll surge up and then the beneficials will be right behind them and take care of business for us. So it's an idea that, uh, it ha you know, when we have good silver bullet approaches to controlling them, not a big deal. But you'll see that uh, Environment Canada, Canada, all of them, they're not really liking expanding production or um, more spraying. It's, it's all about spraying less. So if for some reason they take away certain insecticides, this is a cultural approach or minimum, you know, that can help minimize our, our use of insecticides. Can you pass right behind you the, the winter wheat one there on the left? So this, this popped up last year and a few people came in quite concerned. Let's just pass this one around. If you can find them on this one, you can take a look and bring them back. So, so this is winter wheat, and there's a lot of little white feeding specks out of that. I think it's actually worse on our plots this year than it was even last year, but there were quite a few farmers that phone in, and there's a, 
a, a bunch of the researchers were trying to figure out what it was. And they did identify it as a green grass bug. Um, I believe that uh, it's been worse, and Hector confirmed that this is likely true. It's worse when you have it seeded into cereal stubbles. So it's another one of those rotational type things. So winter wheat, uh, it, it was in barley and, and spring wheat as well, this green grass bug feeding. Pretty significant there, but from what I'm told, there, there's really no concern for it as far as an economic uh, concern. There's a chance that you might find some cereal leaf beetle feeding in some of those plants as well. I have seen that going on, and in a few cases, there's been some fields sprayed. But uh, just wanted to show you guys what it looks like and that it's probably not a big concern. In some of those samples that are being passed around right now, uh, that was winter wheat seeded in, some of it was winter wheat seeded into a barley stubble, and it's part of the trials and the crop sequencing side of things. I think that uh, we're starting to see a, a much elevated disease load in, that, in those plots and in, in those plants and perhaps even some wheat streak mosaic because of the potential for green bridging there. So uh, it's something to keep in mind with the winter wheat and Brian will talk a little bit about that in the crop sequencing side of things. But uh, certainly, you know, I think in this particular case, these trials I'm going to have to spray. So any questions along that? The next one behind you there, please. Yeah, that'll do. I'm going to steal one of these if you want to hold that. So I had a few. Th this is one that we tweeted out, actually. This is Brassica carinata, and we've got that. Um, you probably can't see it, but we're going to pass it around quickly. We've got um, a lot of whitening or sclerosis around the cotyledons on this plant and to be honest with you I didn't really know what it was um, probably the best two guesses that were going around there was that it was actually a seed treatment effect ha have any of you guys seen this anywhere the canola guys see anything that's in canola you have seen it before no How about I pass you one? Probably the two best guesses that we got off of Twitter was that it was, um, it could have been treated with Prosper and it's a halo from Prosper. And the other one is that it could have potentially been a salt effect. Um, I, I'm leaning towards the seed treatment effect and I have seen this on canola as well at times. It, sometimes it, it just grows out of it just fine and it doesn't show up on the new leaves but I uh, thought maybe it's something that you guys could keep an eye out for. I'm a little bit concerned with the amount of phosphorus that we tend to put down with our canola, and I'm thinking that because that's not canola, um, it might be even a little bit more sensitive, so there's differences in sensitivity to seed place phosphorus. What do you guys typically put down, and what do you guys recommend for seed place phosphorus as far as safety is concerned? Anybody brave? Certainly, yeah. Has anybody thought or worried about that at all? You do, eh? Elaborate. Yeah, it probably depends more on moisture than anything, too. I mean, I've seen soil type. Yeah. So, we... We're, this particular field here was an alfalfa for many, many years, and consequently, uh, we tend to have really high nitrogen and very low phosphorus. So we kind of pushed the envelope and put in straight 1152 with the seed, and, and we've gone as high as 80 pounds of actual product down with the seed with lots of times no problems. Yeah, it's pretty high, and I know that guys are always pushing what they can do with their, their particular implements, but... Um, I wonder maybe if the Brassica Carinata is a little bit more sensitive. In this case, we actually only put 35 pounds of product down. No, 60. 
50 products, so about 25 pounds of phosphorus with the seed. So we're going to have to pay a little bit closely attention. These are, these are trials with Agrizoma where they're trying to develop Brassica carinata as a, as a crop for Western Canada. Yes, Rob? Yeah, I'm, I've narrowed it down to either seed treatment or, or salt effect, and I'm thinking it's a seed treatment. I think, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. No, you know, it wasn't actually everywhere. It wasn't on every plant, but um, there was quite a bit of it. And um, I don't know if, I don't think it was patchy. It was pretty much throughout everywhere, but it was not every plant, if that makes sense. Yeah, quite, quite a few. Um, from the most part, it, I think, especially with this rain, I would suspect it's going to grow through, but um, we'll keep an eye out. Anybody having flea, uh, any issues with flea beetles this year? I haven't heard too many reports of any issues. I think the, the seed treatments are working quite well for flea beetles. I did see a tremendous amount last fall that scared me for this year. But uh, maybe the later seeding got us out of it. I don't know. And that's how you'll be able to tell that your seed treatment's working. You'll, you'll find a plant and think, oh my God, I've got a flea beetle problem. It's a volunteer that's come up and that doesn't have that seed treatment on it. It just destroys it. It's amazing what it does to them. Say again? Yeah. 40 pounds. No, not in this, in this trial though, it, it only had 50 pounds. 50 pounds of product. 11.52, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna pass it over to Brian Barris and then he's gonna scramble to try to figure out what he's gonna talk about. Lots, lots, of, lots of wintery? Any downy brome or Japanese brome issues? One guy? Okay, I'm talking to you, Greg. Yeah, really. The rest of you, I hope you don't mind, but I'm gonna talk to Greg for a little bit. Um, Brian, I'm going to just get you to hold this for a second because I did go out and dig a few of them. So I think Ken's got some work to do with his tech transfer to convert some of you guys over to winter wheat. As scientists, we're supposed to be quite objective and impartial, and that's usually the case. But I have to confess, when it comes to winter wheat, I'm quite biased. I think I'm not, I'm not against spring wheat, obviously. I've done a lot of work on spring wheat and continue to do so, but frankly, I don't think we grow enough winter wheat, and I think we grow a little bit too much spring wheat. And I think in the new marketing era, not to mention all the benefits on the agronomic side and the logistics side, I think uh, in the future, winter wheat as an advantage will continue to grow. So hopefully Ken and some of you guys that are in the industry can convince uh, your clients otherwise to maybe uh, switch some of that acreage over. Okay, there's my fill-in for you. Yeah. That was awesome. I'm going to give it back to him. So, Brian has been leading a big project. You, you probably heard him talk at a crop walk or, or the field school last year. The downy brome and Japanese brome is one that the winter wheat growers uh, always brought up as quite a concern. The guys that have been growing winter wheat for a long time Downy brome is a really tough one to control because it's a winter, it's a cereal winter annual, is that right? Winter annual. Yeah, but it's also a cereal in a winter cereal, so it's hard to get it with a pre-seed burn down. Um, the plant doesn't really grow a lot um, until later in the fall, so if you're spraying a burn down before seeding your winter wheat, say mid-September, end of September, Lots of times they haven't germinated yet, so you kind of miss the opportunity to to kill them. Some of the some guys had it so bad that they actually put off seeding their winter wheat until October, so that they had an opportunity to kill the the downy brome and Japanese brome. They're pretty tough wheat to get out of out of winter wheat. So as as a result, though, Brian put together this project that's focused on looking at different options for uh, controlling downy brome and Japanese brome. If you hadn't noticed when you're passing that along, one of those plants is Japanese and one of them is downy. 
So you have to take a close look and tell me which one's which. I just rated our trials. Uh, within the treatments, we've, we've got simplicity, velocity, Everest, Everest 2.0, and the regular, the old Everest, and a new try that Eric Johnson has put on there. Uh, the, the active ingredient is pyroxysulfone. And it's actually a, a herbicide that's registered in corn and soybeans, but it actually uh, seems to be doing quite well. He's got both the fall, a fall application, which is a little bit unconventional. But remember I talked about how those plants, they don't tend to grow until October. Well, if you're doing an in-crop herbicide application in the fall for, for winter wheat, that might be an opportunity to get them. And then we've got the spring applications as well. So Brian can talk about what he found with all of his data. What I can say from what I saw, even just recently, is that Japanese brome, and it could be a function. See, we seeded these weeds. I think downy brome grows more aggressively and faster than the Japanese, which would put it at different stages. So we might need to fine tune our staging if Japanese is a problem versus the downy brome. So I think that the fall applications of our herbicides worked quite well on the Japanese brome. Whereas for the downy brome, I saw better results with the spring applications. But we have to be very careful that those spring applications are timed appropriately to hit the weeds at the right stages. So this, you know, this year in particular, we had a great catch of the, of the downy brome. So we've got a ton of downy brome in there. Uh, so we can really clearly see the results. And uh, the long and the short of it is, is that uh, it is a problem that we're gonna have to tackle. If you're growing a lot of winter wheat and you're building that seed bank in there, uh, it, it will take over and, and you're not going to like growing winter wheat. So I think that there are good options. I'm really excited about the pyroxysulfone option. The only issue is that we're going to have to try to get it registered because it's not currently registered in winter wheat. So, can you take over now? Okay. Okay, so just to continue a little bit on, on that topic. It's, we started off um, without the pyroxysulfone. We just found out about it last year, so we just have the one year data. Um, it's registered as a tank mix with flumioxazin down east, and Ken's right, it's used in corn, but it's registered for soybeans in the US, but more interestingly, it's registered for triticale, I believe, in Australia. So we're not stepping too far outside the box to propose that this could be an effective tool for downy management or brome management here in Canada. And the nice thing about this particular experiment is we can use the data as part of a, a minor use registration package for it. So right now in terms of efficacy and injury, um, we like what we see on both. We don't see really any injury issues with it unless you really start to push the um, rates. And by pushing them, I mean above the label rate. Um, so I, it's looking pretty good and it's looking quite effective. A um, couple of interesting things on the yield side with it um, that we found is the even though we're looking at both chemistries, it's the pyroxysulfone that looks very promising. Um, but we, we had treatments where we, where we looked at the tank mix, fierce it's called, where we, it's a tank mix of flumioxazin and pyroxysulfone. But then we separated out the chemistries where we had just pyroxysulfone and then just flumioxazin. And the pyrox we had it at um, different rates, but um, the flumioxazin on its own did not do very well at all. It had very poor efficacy, lots of weeds. Um, because we're sort of just starting out and we're actually broadcasting and seeding the downy brome, I would say that we probably aren't getting a nice uniform um, distribution and therefore the pressure isn't se as severe as it might be in your plots. So even though there was poor efficacy, it really didn't affect the yield of those plots that were treated with flumioxazin. The yield was actually very good, um, but I still wouldn't run with flumioxazin. The pyrox though, very effective, maintained very high and stable yields. You've probably heard me talk before about yield stability. It's not just the yield at one site in one year. What's more important is how stable is your yield on your farm from year to year. So yield stability is very important. So that means how much is that yield value bouncing around from year to year or from site to site? So 
The Pyrox is very stable over those three sites last year um, and very good and very good yields. The problem though was we saw an antagonistic effect with the tank mix. The tank mix, the efficacy wasn't too bad, although I think Ken was saying it's not that great this year, but the yield actually was below both the chemistries when they were used in isolation. So if we go forward, we're probably going to forget about the flumi oxygen and the tank mix situation for that. So, so that's, um, that's the downy and Japanese brome. And, and it has resurged. It's kind of interesting where, um, so for, for Southern Alberta, if you do, drew sort of a straight line from here all the way down to the border, if you went southwest, that would kind of be the distribution area for Japanese brome because it likes a little bit wetter um, conditions. If you went southeast, then you sort of get into a good distribution area for uh, downy brome, um, which isn't a big surprise. We've dealt with downy brome probably as long as we've cultivated winter wheat. Interestingly, it's kind of moving eastward as an issue. And in fact, even in towards southwestern Manitoba, they've got some issues with downy brome. So this is quite a timely project and if and it's quite exciting that we have an, a, a potential new tool um, in controlling it so um, and who knows maybe it'll be proposed as, as uh, for those of you that cling to your spring wheat as a crop maybe it'll be something that you could use as well um, some of the other areas that we're looking at um, the whole idea of this particular project that wrapped up uh, just this past March was how can we ensure consistent stand establishment for producers. So I've, I've been into winter wheat research now for over a decade. And so we've put together a good agronomic package in terms of combining good genetics with appropriate seeding rates. And that means high seeding rates of at least 450 seeds per square meter or 45 seeds per square foot. And interestingly enough, I have some spring wheat studies uh, where I went that high as well with Durham and some high yielding CWRS and they are responding very well to those higher seeding rates as well. And, and that's where you also get some nice weed competitive ability at that rate as well. So although your economics may not be justified beyond a seed input cost uh, beyond 350, for example, the weed competitive ability that you get beyond that, the uniformity of your canopy, uh, the reduced uh, maturity that you get, um, which obviously aids you at harvest, those are all the non-tangible benefits or the benefits that we can't quantify in a scientific study. So those are important considerations, whether you're growing spring wheat or winter wheat. Um, but the one question we had was the role of seed treatments. And uh, there had been some anecdotal evidence one way or the other that uh, seed treatment, because it's a coating, it might delay emergence and, and stand establishment in the fall, or it might actually enhance it. So. Uh, we put together a couple of studies where we were integrating seed treatments into a, a cropping system. Um, so some interesting findings from that was we indeed saw some uh, very significant responses using a seed treatment um, with winter wheat um, and where we saw a very uh, notable difference or a notable positive response to seed treatments were in situations where you had a um, relatively low plant stand and to achieve that we planted some plots at a very low seeding rate of 200 or 250 seeds per square meter and compared that to a planting of 400 or 400 so in an agronomic system where you have a low planting population or or in a situation where you didn't get ideal emergence maybe you planted into really dry soil conditions and things didn't come up as much as you would have liked um, and if your seed quality wasn't as good as you would have liked, so we were also comparing it to uh, various levels of seed vigor, those weaker agronomic systems responded um, in terms of magnitude far, far greater than a strong agronomic system. So, um, and the economics around it are quite positive too. And, and uh, there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, and, if you're, and if you're going to start looking at this as a recommendation to farmers or if you're a farmer and you're considering it as a as a management tool to enhance stand establishment whether it's uh, um, winter wheat or spring wheat the consideration goes back to the actual insecticidal components so the seed treatments we separated out all the chemistries we were just fungicides compared to various fungicides compared to 
just an insecticidal only treatment compared to your regular dual, and in our case, we're using a Raxel WW. And it's that insecticide, um, particularly, that gives you that, that little boost in vigor um, that aids, and that in our case was translating into a yield advantage. And we now have about 18 site years, and that's a very robust data set. And um, the results are, uh, are quite compelling, actually. Um, but again, don't go out and recommend a fungicidal only seed treatment because you're likely not to see the advantage uh, strictly with that. It's that com combination, and, and in our case, it, it's the thymethoxin in uh, Raxel WW um, that was uh, the key there. And, and the reason it's the key is it'll regulate and uh, inside that plant um, those type of systems that are responsible for um, the inducement of stress in a plant. So it modulates that in a plant, and that's why you're getting that, that bigger boost. Yeah? What kind of a yield advantage would you see then with the insecticide versus without the insecticide? Um, off the top of my head, I can't recall. Um, there was, there was um, as far as a high, consistent um, yield response, generally it was always the combination that provided the best. There was the odd time where tebuconazole was up there as well. But, but the other story to this um, is we were also putting down uh, fall applied fungicides as an additional treatment. So in the fall, when the winter week came up, we would go in and we would apply, in our case we were using proline because it's a chemistry that wasn't in any of the others. So it's a prothioconazole whereas we were using tebuconazole and blah, blah, blah for the others. And so um, you wouldn't typically use proline, and we heard that over and over again. But for our reasons, we were going, it was, it was a chemistry thing. And so the interesting thing was we designed that treatment. Yeah, let's put down fall applied fungicide, because in this area, there are times when we get some pathogens entering into our crop in the fall, and that might be an issue. Um, otherwise, we were like, that would you wouldn't have a hope in hell of seeing any response, but that really, in a sense, wasn't the case. We saw a very positive response to the fall proline. Going back to your question, the high and consistent yield with tebuconazole was in combination with that fall applied proline. And uh, the reason I mention that is that we might be looking at a different seed treatment that's currently being used in Europe, um, and they're thinking there might be some frost tolerance to it. And the chemistry is prothioconazole, which is what's in proline. So I don't know if there's a relationship to that or not, but I can tell you what we saw in sites where we put down fall applied fungicides, where we had stripe rust, for example, it was very effective. Typically, you don't think that those uh, spores will overwinter outside of, say, Lethbridge, but we had stripe rust in Melfort, we had stripe rust in Scott, Saskatchewan, and those. Uh, those applications of that fall fungicide significantly increased grain yield for those for those plots versus no no foliar fungicides. Um, the other interesting thing is that Lacombe, where there was no stripe rust, Brandon, where there was no stripe rust, there was a vigor. Um, even in Lethbridge last year, where we had no stripe rust, you could walk those plots, and the plots that had the fall applied proline were cleaner in terms because we had we had our fair share of leaf spotting and that sort of thing. But those plots that had the fall applied fungicide were cleaner. They had a more vigorous look to them. Um, powdery mildew was quite a problem at Lacombe. There was no powdery mildew in the fall applied plots in the spring compared to those that didn't receive any of that. So there's something going on with, with applying a fungicide in the fall that's creating some sort of systemic activity that's giving that plant a potential advantage. Now that's not to say we're going to go out and recommend you know, prophylactic applications of fall applied fungicides. We need to understand that a little bit better, but um, that's, the, that's the full meal deal on, on seed treatments. Uh, any questions on that? So we're also going to look at comparing those seed treatments in both winter wheat and spring wheat systems. And I, I think it's on the 20th. We're back here for a tour. Um, we have a we have a study where we're looking at and comparing both spring wheats and winter wheats um, and uh, in in the management of, of uh, leaf diseases and fusarium using seed treatments and foliar applied fungicides um, so the preliminary data on that one again is just 
to reinforce winter wheat over spring wheat is last year, looking at the plots out here, I was looking at the winter wheat. We had pretty good canopy, pretty good growth, but we had a lot of leaf disease. And uh, we didn't want to spray everything because we had foliar fungicide treatments, right? So I was looking at that and I'm looking at the spring wheat that's looking a hell of a lot better. And I'm thinking, once again, Ken's going to try and outdo me with the spring wheat over the winter wheat. Um, because I would have I would have bet money that the spring wheat would have out yielded the winter wheat last year, but that was not the case. Turns out the winter wheat, even in those conditions, out yielded the spring wheat by about 20%. So you can do the math on that uh, and the economics. So um, and we'll walk those plots, I guess, on the 20th and learn more about that as well. Um, okay, crop sequencing. Um, there's issues with winter wheat and trying to get it on into the ideal stubble uh, canola stubble particularly as you move north if you're trying to convince growers in the parkland to grow winter wheat their chances of planting onto canola stubble are next to zero because as our yield potential has been increasing with canola it's been directly related to an increase in growing degree day requirements so if you've Noticed your canola these days, the maturity ranges on them have increased quite a bit, which isn't the big deal down here. And they're definitely pushing it up north. The problem though is you have zero chance of getting winter wheat in after that before the snow flies. So we need alternatives. And one of them um, that's used quite successfully is peas. Um, barley would be another one. And so um, we're doing some work on crop sequencing. We've published some work from that already where um, we've been able to show growers that um, as far as the ideal stubble type, it doesn't have to be canola. You can be just as successful with your grain yield, even in harsh conditions like up north, um, going with pea stubble. So the grain yield of canola stubble was equal to pea stubble, which was also equal to barley silage stubble. Now when you get into going on to barley grain stubble, that becomes a different issue for a lot of various reasons, including trash, and potential issues with that trash stealing some of that nitrogen away in the form of an immobilization. So um, barley grain stubble is not ideal unless you have very, very effective residue management um, uh, incorporated along with that. But, but certainly um, there's been some hesitation on the part of growers with pea stubble um, and, and the data now is borne out that it's, that it's just as good as canola. The only caveat to that would be there was one instance in my career so far that I saw where a grower in Nobleford uh, planted onto pea stubble in a year we were in our drought year that I think I'm going to guess that that was about 2001 2002 when we saw it he had peas he put I believe Odyssey down very dry um, low organic matter soil so there was no real chance for that herbicide to go anywhere there was a bit of a residual he went in he planted it his, uh, his winter wheat behind that and there was an issue with herbicide carryover. So that would be the only issue and, and but that issue would really be restricted to our soils down here where we are in lower organic matter situations and those years where you've had quite a severe drought and it has to be very severe. We've had years quite dry since 2002, no issue at all but where it's, where it's severe and then you go into the fall with um, with some winter wheat that there's a bit of a danger there but that's that's one train wreck out of a 13 year run here where um, otherwise it's been very effective any questions yeah i had uh winter wheat last fall on third hill canola stubble where we had odyssey and no issues but is there a use for it yeah and there you go so so you get you've got that opportunity where that chemical is going to be one way or another metabolized or or uh, the soil microbes are going to get at it and digest it, and so it's not an issue. But, but it just remains there and is not chemically or molecular, you know, interfered with. There's 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 danger there. But yeah, it's almost never. So I guess we really are just having a conversation with Greg there. <laughs> Well, yeah, it kind of goes back to the example that Ken also was sharing with you, um, not with disease per se, but in this case, it's, um, well, it was in two cases. Um, one, you have 
an issue with uh, um, the green grass bug. Uh, the other issue again is goes back to that whole green bridge issue, which isn't as much of a problem as it used to be, but there's the odd time where if you aren't diligent in burning down all that green material of, of surrounding grasses uh, uh, of any kind of cereal, wheat, barley, then yeah, you can run into issues. So if you recrop right on top of wheat or barley and you, and you have issues with, with um, you know, a synchronization of, you know, volunteers coming up after a glyphosate application that happen to have that wheat curl mite, then they're going to transfer and potentially vector over a wheat streak mosaic virus. But typically we, we don't see that as much as we used to and, and we certainly don't see it, I would argue, any more in winter wheat than we do in spring wheat. Probably more so in Durham, frankly, than I see in anything else these days. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't hear that. I have it. Have you, Ken? So you're talking about a seed dressing? And right. Um, yeah, the only work that I've seen on, on that type of thing has been uh, out of Indian Head and after running it over so many sites, they didn't find, they didn't find a significant difference or an advantage to using it, but they might have not been using the exact same dressing that you had you know, combined with your seed treatment, but they're, they're, you know, we're, we're in a very profitable phase with our cereals and there's going to be a lot of, a lot of products out there that, that, uh, you are presented with. So, um, there's opportunity, I think with Ken's group to have a look at some of that, but certainly we're not going to be able to look at it all. I think, um, if you, if you start with the things that have a big influence on your cereal crop, and the two major limiting factors are water and nitrogen. I think you start from there. So you start with a good system and then you look at your, you can't control water, but you can control nitrogen. And then you start breaking it down from there. Good seed lots, good high seeding rates, and potentially treatments or dressings that you think might be, a, be a, of an advantage on your own farm. What else was I supposed to talk about? Or is that enough? Yeah, where's the fireplace? Piling <laughs> up here. I don't. I don't think we have a, have a ton more to talk about. Um, we we do have a number of trials that we just started this year, Herb, and I'm not sure if it. Are you talking about Awaken? Maybe. That's different. There, there's actually a whole swath load of different types of seed primers and products out there these days and, and we're seeing more and more come up now and you know the story is oh we've been doing it in the states forever and you guys are just behind the time so I think companies are starting to try to expand their markets into to other areas so there's a lot of different things that are that are interesting and you know what sometimes I think you do see an effect sometimes they work sometimes they don't um, I can say that we do have a few company trials this year that are looking at you know growth hormones, um, seed primers, lots of different stuff that you can spray on that are supposed to be like root enhancers and such. Yeah. No, th there's no requirement for data. Yeah, you guys have to be responsible yourselves. You know, we talked about this in, in years past, and that there's currently been changes to CFIA regulations. The, the data that needs to be supplied for, for registration as a, a crop growth enhancer is not the same as, say, PMRA for efficacy and herbicides. It tends to be more environmentally based now, so they got to prove that it's not going to kill the environment, but they don't have to prove that it works. And if you, I think rule of thumb is you pay very particular attention to the label and see what their claims are. If their claim is that it's going to give you a bigger boost, 
and it doesn't very specifically say a yield boost, then that's all they're claiming. And I have often seen, like you said, a, a root growth enhancement. Um, the odd time I do see a yield advantage, but not too often. But uh, that, that, that's why I think all the more important that you that you test it and you know you compare it to not having it and compare it to an equal amount of investment in something else as well. So we're going to try to touch on that a little bit in some of the next crop walks. We do have uh, to, to introduce the Canola Council guys. They wanted to address this when it comes to canola. So they put together a Western Canada project that Neil Harker out of Lacombe and Murray Hartman and all the Canola Council agronomists built this, this uh, trial. And we're doing it as a fully replicated trial. We've got one here in Lethbridge and one in Medicine Hat. And they're calling it the ultimate canola challenge. So they're going to try to do sort of conventional management, you know, your basic NNP and seeding rate and all that sort of stuff. And they're, they're actually going to stack it up to some seed primers, to some, some of these plant growth enhancers and a, dump, a number of different micronutrient type approaches so that uh, they're going to take it head on and, and see, see what the results are. So I, I think that's pretty interesting. It's fine, you know, for the most part, researchers are really afraid to, to tackle these types of, of products because, well, for one, they can get sued if they say the wrong thing at the wrong time. But... You know, we've been hearing it enough from growers that they'd like to know a little bit more about it. Um, and I, I can tell you that some of the companies are genuinely trying to invest and, and generate some real data. So we'll look forward to that in the next couple of years. Now it's really starting to rain, so we should go for a walk outside. Who's up? You should, you should hear it when it hails in here. I think you're going to die. Yeah. Um, I guess I wanted to officially thank Brian and and Dune and, and everybody else that uh, that helped out. I think we're going to wrap it up for the most part. We are going to try to do this uh, every Thursday up until the field school week, which, if you didn't know, we moved to the end of June. We thought that you know typically that in July things are progressed a little bit too far, and of course the the, the, the time that we decide to move it, we have a late year, but um, things are catching up. So June 25th to 27th is the field school. Um, we've got a really, really neat uh, program. We even have a visiting scientist from from Australia with Kelly Turkington. So the theme is down under, essentially, under the ground. Where we learn about wire worms. We've got a number of different um, pretty cool modules going on. And I also wanted to mention uh, we're really, really close to the last date for our Montana research tour. I don't know if you heard about this through our mail outs or not, but we're, we've got a bus and we're going to load it up with booze. I mean, people and head to Montana and tour all of the, the Montana research facilities. Dr. Perry Miller has some really great stuff down in Bozeman. Um, we had a great time. We went down to South Dakota last year and saw Dwayne Beck's uh, facilities and we saw the University of South Dakota and we gave it a try and, and everybody had so much fun they said you guys got to do this every year so this is really kind of our fun trip and we might learn something along the way but uh, it's only 500 bucks it's two nights that includes all of the the travel the meals and i think maybe even booze um but uh, if you are interested please check out the website we need to have registration within a week here basically we've got a bit of a buffer but um check it out uh, we'd love to have you along and I, I think we're down to nobody going for a walk now, so we'll just... Any any last questions? Any Anytime you guys have uh, something that you'd like to see at a crop walk, please just send us a note too. We've got about 85 different research trials right now, so um, we were going to look at the night spraying, but it's uh, really in our low spot where all the weeds are, so it's a little bit mucky. We did see, again, differences this year as far as the, the burn down is concerned. Uh, night actually didn't look great. Again, middle of the day is still the best. I think we had actually throughout the month of May, once it did warm up, the nighttime temperatures were warmer this year than they were last year. Uh, and I think they're seeing some, some different effects in that regard. But any last comments from anybody? Doom, Rob, Doom even here. We'll call it a day then. Please take a donut for the road. Have a good day.